Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Today we are in Monte Carlo in uh, Fabrizio Moretti's new gallery and um, we will talk about art and also about another gallery because you open a gallery in London in uh, two buildings that became one that you built both many years ago and you rebuilt and that would be your home and your gallery. Why do you need to have more than one gallery? You know, galleries are important. I really believe and hope that the art market will go back how it was in the beginning of the 20th century, where people go to the galleries the Saturday, the Sunday, to enjoy the relationship with the dealer, to see works of art. But this is not the case of these days. As you may know, the auction houses, the art fairs, they took the monopoly of the market. And today for a single private collector, it's more easy to go to Basel, to Maastricht or to Florence, and in one day to meet 80, 100 dealers under the same head. But the romanticism to meet a dealer in his gallery, to talk about a painting, maybe to drink a nice coffee and to build the collection, that for me is irreplaceable. So what will be this gallery in London? I mean, here in Monte Carlo, you have a smaller gallery than in London. What do you keep here? What do you show? More or less, I am a dealer that uh, deals in Italian or masters. I am specialized in early Renaissance, which I love more, mannerism. And we try to keep the same stock in London or in Monte Carlo. We don't go for modern and contemporary. I collect modern and contemporary for myself, but as a dealer, I prefer to be recognized as an old master paintings dealer. A very rare business today because uh, the old master market is like a chess game. Not a lot of players, very sophisticated, and we try to improve this and to teach the new generations to understand the, the beautiful age of the past. So in Monte Carlo in London, we will do programs of small exhibitions, catalogs. It will be my main residence uh, as a private dealer because uh, we don't work very publicly, but we work with institution or with private collectors. And sometimes uh, I do also some collaboration with auction houses where I can create my own single sales. You have a long experience that comes from your origin, from your family, on old master paintings. I think your father was a very important teacher in your life, in your early life. You have achieved many important results by this. I mean, you have sold some very important paintings in prominent museums all over the world, right? From the Metropolitan to New York, to the Fort Worth Kimball Museum, uh, to the National Gallery in London, and so on and so forth, right? It looks like if old masters, there are very few collectors, but I don't know why we have the feeling that old masters belong to museums, right? Because they are history, right? Is it true? They are history, they belong to museums. The museums, they have for sure the major quantity of old masters in the world. And it's very good because I believe that art is a patrimonial of humanity. So I think that art should be free for everybody and everybody should have the right to go in a museum and to enjoy what uh, the human being has produced in the past. On the market, there are not so many great masterpieces left because, as I said, they are all in public uh, institutions. It's different from modern and contemporary art where there is a lot of stock in the museums, but there is a lot of stock also in private collection and a lot of stock has been produced by contemporary living artists. I believe that, uh, unfortunately, is a problem of a culture that the new generation don't think that it's possible to buy an old master painting because they think, as you said, that the old master painting belongs to a category of not touchable paintings, not touchable items. And uh, I think that uh, my generation of dealers should try to sensibilize the the new generation and make understand that it's possible to buy masters and to mix all masters with contemporary art is not a bad idea. As you know, in your own town, Turin, there is a fantastic sign outside the modern art gallery. 
arte è sempre stata contemporanea. Art has always been contemporary. So you see, you should always look art 360 degrees. As you said, old masters belong to great museums. Maybe young people think they can't afford them, you know. Instead, it's sometimes easier for a museum to buy an old master painting than a contemporary art painting, because most of the time they are cheaper on the market. So this is one thing. The other thing is to buy contemporary art, most of the time you can see the artist and he can tell you this is my painting, <laughs> right? In the case of old masters, how do you know that this painting is a Caravaggio or is not a Caravaggio? That's difficult, right? Because there are many fakes and also many artists produce the same work maybe twice or three times. And so which one is the origin? Now, this is a very good question and this is a point that maybe puts the new investor or buyer, if you want to call it like this, in a doubt situation. Because when he buys a modern contemporary art, he's got an archive, sometimes he's got the artist that can prove the originality of the item. In our case, it's different. We call them attributions. Now, some paintings we can prove they are right because they are documented, they are signed. This is only few cases. Most of the time, you know, you come to an attribution because there is a, an unanimous art historian consents of it, but is an attribution. Sometimes on some paintings, uh, there will be a debate on the attribution. Somebody will say white, somebody will say red. This is part of the game of the old master world. You need to accept that an attribution could change. But what you need to see on a master picture is the quality. When you have the quality of the triple hayak, we say in our language, you cannot go wrong. For sure, if you buy a Caravaggio, then afterwards it turns out to be a copy of Caravaggio, the value is not there anymore, or works from Caravaggio. But you need to be very careful in this and try to consult the best art historians and go to go in the best art gallery. But when you buy the quality, the top quality, you never go wrong. You now have a long experience. How do you decide that a painting is a real one or it's a fake? And an example of the very famous painting, La Gioconda, for instance. Yes. There are many Giocondas. Which one is the real one? Or are the many painted by Leonardo? Or were they painted by some of his pupils? That is very difficult. We know that the original one, because it's documented, because it went to France with Leonardo, is the one in the Louvre that was found in his house when he passed away. And then afterwards, as you know, there are many other versions that came on the market as workshop, as follower, and actually they're making also a lot of money. Maybe some of them are done by his followers. Salai, there was uh, one of his closest uh, scholars in his workshop. That you need to live with a doubt. The certainty is difficult to prove, understand. But as I said, the quality is the main point. To but judge. as we said, you know, for instance, Take a painting of Raphael. One of the pupils, one of the people who worked with Raphael was Giulio Romano. Exactly. So it might be that a painting started by Raphael was ended by Giulio Romano. How is it? No, no, but this is totally right. In the workshop of the 15th century, there was the main uh, actor. Understand? Think of the workshop of Verrocchio. He had uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Lorenzo di Credi, Botticelli, Perugino. This is a top workshop, understand? And sometimes it's difficult to recognize the end of the young artist. So the painting is named workshop, but it doesn't mean that it's less important than an autograph painting. And you, personally, since you began, first of all, did you improve your knowledge, your capability to recognize the paintings or to know more experts than you did before? I must say that this is a work where every day you learn a lesson. Every day a painting can put you in front of a mystery, can put you in front of a big doubt. You know, also the problem of the fakes, that they are fakes like uh, also in modern art. You need to be very careful, but uh, I think I'm able to recognize quite quickly a fake. I'll tell you why. When you see an original painting, you can got the feeling that the painting sinks. A fake also, if it's well done, never sinks. And the faker does always a mistake, puts inside always his sign. Not because he signs the picture, but he wants to do a little bit more to the painting. So you understand there is something that is not matching. 
For example, I deal in gold grounds. Gold grounds were a lot uh, copied from the oro, gold backs, gold grounds. They were made in the 14th century, 13th century and 15th century. But in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a big fashion of gold grounds. And there was this person in Siena, Icilio Federico Ioni, that it was a sort of restorer faker that used to do from you a fake gold ground or sometimes getting a very bad condition gold ground and redo it and make it beautiful to sell it to the American market. And we know some fakes that now they are recognized in American museums. And uh, before, maybe it was difficult to recognize the difference between a good one or a bad one because it was very clever. But today, for me, Icilio Federico Ioni is quite recognizable, understand? I can see it from five meters. Yeah, but many old master paintings have been restored and restored again over the years, right? Yes, yeah. but that doesn't mean it's there are a fake. Not many, many paintings that are completely original without being restored. No, it's very difficult to find a painting in mint condition today that has never been touched. I think there are not many examples in the world. I mean, the one in public institution, in private collection, they were sitting there for ages and they never touched them. The paintings that have been around, they've been unfortunately touched. Clean, retouched, clean, retouched. So when you buy an old master, you need to put uh, in your mind the idea that uh, it will have got some restoration. Some paintings arrive in our hands in very good condition. And how do you buy them? When do you decide that you will buy this specific painting? Or it happens in your life that sometimes you discover out of the blue, somewhere in the world, a painting that nobody knew that it existed or that people were looking for. But, you know, there's a name for this kind of paintings. We call them the sleepers. That it means that uh, you find uh, great paintings that are miscatalogues in uh, small cells. And afterwards, uh, you find out that these paintings are important. There was a uh, one painting that came up in Spain in April 2021, and uh, the picture, unbelievable picture, was catalogued as a attributed workshop to Ribera, of Ribera, 1,500 euros. And it was a fantastic Eceomo, and this painting it turned out to be a masterpiece by Caravaggio. It was redrawn by the auction house, so it didn't went to public sale. Unfortunately for me and my dear friend Marco Buena, they went to Madrid with me to buy this painting. And when we arrived, the painting not was anymore on the market. And uh, the Prado straight away notified the painting. So the painting now is patrimonium of, uh, of Spain, is unexportable. And uh, we hope now that somebody will buy it for gift it to the Prado. Maybe the Prado will buy it directly from the family. So this is an, an amazing story of uh, maybe the most important discovery of the last 20 years. For me, the Caravaggio is the biggest discovery of the famous Salvador Mundi that was discovered 20 years ago in a small cell in America. But this brings me to another question. This Caravaggio made so that the Caravaggio that is in the museum in Genova, who was considered a Caravaggio, it's now not. we know that it's not a Caravaggio, right? No, no, because the painting documented in Genova is this painting that was found in Madrid. How Genova. can we be sure that the Madrid one is the real one and the Genova is not? The Genova one was always been questioned attribution. It never was fully accepted by all the art historians as work well of Caravaggio. And now with the discovery of this one that uh, we found it in Spain, but we know that this is a famous picture that left Italy and went to Spain, uh, I think in the um, half 17th century. This is another proof and the quality and the mystery. I can tell you I was in front of the picture. The picture sing. It was like looking uh, a cinema movie because Caravaggio is the first artist that uh, in a way invents a scene. You know, the Ecce Homo in the front, uh, on the back, the soldier looking, understand? It's uh, an unbelievable picture. It's a sense of reality the only Caravaggio can uh, describe and can give a lesson to but the people. But once, uh, for instance, like for this Caravaggio, right? You said the Prado took it, put a hole in it. Yes. Therefore, it cannot be exported anymore. No. So, therefore, it has no value anymore, right, on the market. It's got a national it value. It happens... 
for many paintings, also in Italy, right? Masterpieces that are of equal quality, that if they are notificati, they're worth X. If they are somewhere else in the world, they're worth much more. For people like you who deal in art. Yes, for me, it's bad, but I believe in the fact that the state should look properly the patrimonial. Some paintings should be stopped. What I think it's difficult to judge is what it could go out, what it could stay in. And this is something that Italy should work on, but I am totally for the protection of our patrimonial. I think that these laws are quite right. I think in Spain did the right thing to stop it, and it would be amazing to see a painting that was in Spain from the 17th century to be back in a national museum like uh, the Prado. France and England, they got different laws. They can stop the pictures, but uh, if there is an offer from uh, another state, if they're not able to raise the same amount, they will give the export license to the picture. So England and France... They recently for some Rembrandts in France. Exactly. The two Rembrandts, they were bought by the Rex Museum. So this is maybe better for the seller, and it doesn't uh, take a disadvantage in the life of the owner. Some countries like Italy or Spain, where they have a lot of masterpieces, maybe they cannot afford to match the prices and recompense. So the only way is to put la notifica, I don't know how you can call it in, in English, the stop of the item to make sure it doesn't leave the country. Then there are exceptions. We talked about the Prado this morning. You know, when a man arrives to the Prado and has an Antonello da Messina, which is one of his very few paintings and great masterpieces, and asks to the what is this? This is a case of Del Cristo che piange al Prado, no? By Antonello da Messina. Yes. These kind of things happen. These kind of things happen. They used to happen. Used to happen in the past. But, you know, if you read the book about, many books about the history, there are many paintings that we still don't know where they are. And the nice thing of my job is to try to find them. You know, every time you look at a small auction, you always hope to find the great discovery. I don't know if you have seen, but recently in a country sale was bought for $30, an engraving that it turns out to don't be an engraving, but a drawing by Dürer. And the value is 30, 50 million. I'm thinking of the poor guy that sold this house uh, for nothing, for like junk, and also this little piece of paper for $30, and he had a way of Dürer. This is part of the beautiful story of uh, our dealing. But well, what about the market? You said that uh, the collectors of old matters are like a niche. Yes. You know, there are a few people. So obviously they know the risks they take. They probably know very well, not like you, but in any case with you, if a painting is a real painting or if it's a fake or Bottega, they may know it. What kind of prices there are on old masters? I mean, many more people could afford old masters than contemporary art? No, yes. The old master paintings market is totally undervalued and uh, with the same amount of... It has always been undervalued? But no, in the past, in the 50 or the 60, the old master was a strong market uh, and the values were very high with the same values of the modern art. Today, you know, with for example, speaking about numbers, if I may, with two, three million dollars, you can buy a drawing by Basquiat, a normal drawing. With three million dollars, you can buy a great old master painting that could hang easily in any museum of the world. So that makes you think that when you are in front of the top, top old masters, there are not many, you can go at values of 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, other, also 100 millions. In public sale, you know, the most expensive old master, I think, was the famous uh, Rubens that was sold for 60 or 70 million pounds, that bought by the Thompson family and now hanging in the National Gallery of Canada. And then there is the famous Leonardo. Yeah, that is the famous Leonardo. They made 450. But that, I consider that item, this I didn't mention it, like a, a superstar. Because when you talk about Leonardo, it's not an old master painter. You cannot compare it to anything else because Leonardo was the genius, understand? Architect, writer, painter, sculpture. Leonardo is out of the game. And this discovery was the, the discovery for that changed the life to many people, may make you understand that when a brand comes on the market... Yeah, but this Salvatore Mundi, they are not sure it's the right one. 
Now, as I told you on the beginning, you need to put always in doubt that are all master. Because there are others around. Yeah, others. But I can tell you, personally, I believe the painting is uh, fully autographed. The painting is not in good condition, so maybe it's not uh, beautiful as Leonardo in the first place. But when you see the beautiness of that hand, the strongness, the power, only Leonardo could have done it. You know, people like to question things also because when they are on the market, they like to create the doubt for damage the picture. It's a national game, actually international game to destroy other paintings. But uh, in this case, I think the painting is is autograph. Which is uh, the most valuable painting you sold in your career, in your life? Speaking about values is difficult and I think... Uh, is not fair for the, the buyer. But I sold many paintings to uh, public institutions that I'm very proud of. I sold uh, this beautiful Canaletto to the Getty. It was one of my first important sales in 2013. And uh, I sold this. I helped the museum to buy other paintings. Through other dealers, I sold to the Kimball. Then uh, with my dear friend Marco Boena, I sold this beautiful self-portrait of Artemisa Gentileschi to the National Gallery in London. And this was, I think, one of the most important sales. Also because it was one of the few occasions that the National Gallery decided to buy a picture not coming from the UK. This was a picture that came from France. And it's one of the first times that the, that the National Gallery bought a painting from an Italian dealer. So this was a great satisfaction. And in this moment of uh, restanding of Artemisia, I think that we have sold the best painting that Artemisia did in her life. And this is a self-portrait of the artist. So I think that we are both, myself, proud of this sale. Museums pay the same private people and collectors at museums. Yes. Pay the same no, I must tell you that the museums always uh, accept to pay the good price and to give the profit to the dealers. Actually, it's more easy to negotiate with the museum than a private collector. Where did you find this at the museum? We found it in Paris. It was also attributed, it was with Eric Turquin, you know, this Commissaire Pizer. It was sold in one of the auctions of Drouot. And the picture made, I can tell you because it's so public, was bought for 2.4 million euros. And it was sold to the National Gallery of London for 3.6 million pounds. I'm telling this because it came out in the newspaper, so it's no secret. Sometimes buying a painting may be very long, right? Because if a private person owns a painting, maybe you have to quote him or to wait when he wants to sell it, right? But in auction, it goes very quickly. Right? So how do you decide that you really want when okay. you see a painting in auction and you like it, you give yourself a limit. Say, I will bid until this amount of money, let's say $100,000. And afterwards, if you're on the phone, you always go higher because the auction, this is why the auction wins, especially with the people of China, because they like gambling. You always go further because you don't want to lose it. So if somebody else has got the picture, you need to decide in a fraction of a second. And normally... You always go over your limit. How do you attribute the value of a painting or an old master? It's very difficult. It's a good question because every old master has his own price because every old master is unique. In modern art, you know, Fontana, what color is? White. How many cuts this? How many dimension? And you can say this is the value also without seeing a picture because it's like the stock market. In old masters, you can have paintings from the same artist, let's say Luca Giordano, a very prolific artist, that has paintings that uh, make fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and you got paintings that sold for a million, a million and a half. It's the painting that makes the price. Art is also fashion, right? Before time, Fontana was not at all considered by the market for many years. Suddenly, he became very fashionable, and now it's like Coca-Cola, right? But it might be that one day people get tired of saying, oh, I have Fontana, but there's so many other people who have it. And then they sell it because they fell in love with something else. Yes. I can tell you something. One day I was with uh, Paolucci, you know, the ex-superintendent of Florence, ex-minister of art. And he said to me that in the beginning of the century, in evaluation of La Galleria Borghese, a gold ground by Sano di Pietro was being given a value of 10 times more than a painting of Caravaggio. Because at that time, Caravaggio not was discovered. Caravaggio was discovered in the 60s by Roberto Longhi with the famous exhibition of Caravaggio in Milan. So, for that moment, 
it changed the market of Caravaggio. And this is the proof of what you said, is the fashion. Paintings should not be bought because of fashion, should so be you, bought you, because you, you like them. You might think that Caravaggio will be less important no. in uh, 50 years' time. No, this I don't think so, because Caravaggio today is the legend. It's a brand, understand? And actually, he invented something. The artists that invented something, I think, I believe, they will always stay on the market. Like Piero della Francesca. Like Piero della Francesca, like Lucio Fontano. Lucio Fontano invented l'arte spaziale, il concetto spaziale. He was the first. And I think he will always stay on the market. I believe, if we speak about numbers, that Lucio Fontana is still undervalued. But because he's Italian and he hasn't got the international crowd that some American artists have, I prefer Lucio Fontana at Mark Rothko. That's a question of taste. Yes, but more or less they're doing the same thing. Arte concettuale, conceptual art. Fontana is known for the cut, right? Exactly, yeah, the cut is what... Uh, and there are so many Fontanas with the cut now. Yes. Around. But one thinks, where were they before? Before they were only white, very few that we know, we have seen, and then suddenly it's multicolored everywhere. Is it fake? No. Also, Fontana, you know, it's easy to make a fake because it's a cut, but there is a foundation... And there are many ways to recognize a fake of Fontana. So I suggest to somebody who wants to buy a Fontana to make all the research. But you must know that uh, the quality of a painting of Fontana is judged also on the quality of the cuts. If you go near, the best Fontanas are the ones that got very tough cuts. When the cut is moving a little bit, that is not a good cut. And maybe it's not a Fontana. No, maybe it's Fontana in a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to old masters, what I understood is that um, besides the museums that are growing all over the world, there are many more museums than were before, therefore there will certainly still be a market, you know, because one day or another they will be eager to have, as much as they have a Picasso, they will want to have a Rembrandt. In the collectors, you said that you regretted, I read this in the previous interview, you regret the fact that there are very few people of your generation, you know, you're a man of 45 or even younger, are interested in old masters. That is true. Yes, I would like to have more people of my age, they would like old masters, that they would like to, to collect them, but not for the business point of view, because I think it's important to have new blood in the system because new blood, they can become uh, mecenati, you know, donors to museums. These museums, they need uh, money for young art historians. They need money for the restoration departments. You know, all the old masters is the past, is the history that we need to give to the new generation. So it's important that this generation supports it and understands it and loves it. So I'm quite worried. But it's a problem of culture. It's a totally problem of culture. But it's also probably a problem, they say the question of fashion, you know, the world goes on. So people furnish their houses in a different way. I mean, if there is a crisis for uh, the 18th century French paintings, there's the same crisis for the furniture, there's the same crisis for the arazzi, because people decorate homes in a different way today. So contemporary art fits more with contemporary furniture and architecture and all this. It's perfectly right. You touch a very important subject. Unfortunately, the new generation lives in different houses, smaller houses, and they don't like anymore to have uh, a lot of items around. Yeah, but the small, you know, contemporary artists make very, sometimes very, very big paintings that you don't even know where they can fit in a house. Exactly. But sometimes these paintings are bought and kept in storage, unfortunately, because what is the key of the success of modern or contemporary art is that uh, most of the times people buy also for investment. They see the item like a stock. They say, I buy it today because this artist will go up as an investment. And I think that that is the wrong way to see art. Art is a luxury. You should buy because you can afford it. You should make sure you buy the right thing at a fair price. You should live with it, love it. And then in the end, if you want to resell it, you need to see how the market will be. But some contemporary artists talk about the fact that you have to do, in order to be, you have to do multiple works. Let's take the example of Damien Hirst. 
But this is a bit the concept of the Bottega, right? We said there is one Gioconda and there are 25 <laughs> others, right? Yes, but the difference in contemporary art is that you don't have a Bottega. Everything is autographed. If you go in Jeff Kuhn's studio, he doesn't touch anything. He's got the idea and he's got many workers, painters, executing. But it's not uh, Jeff Koons and Bottegas. Jeff Koons is the idea. In your master world, we are more picky. We try to understand where the artist, the main artist, did the job from A to Z. Is it a contradiction? You said you would like many people of your age to have uh, knowledge and love for old masters. But why do you collect contemporary art no. and not old masters? No, I collect also old masters. Collecting old masters is my priority. But I collect also modern and contemporary because uh, I love art 360 degrees. I don't say this is A, this is B. And I would like the people to do the same. Yeah, but as you are very knowledgeable in old masters, okay, you said your specialty are the Italian painters. From when to when? From the 13th century to the 18th century. And do you have some icons for you? I mean, or some wishes you would like to own? Who knows, a Tiziano or Caravaggio? What are the... No, I think Caravaggio is impossible to find unless I make a discovery in some small cell, the famous sleepers. But, you know, one came out last year, so this year I think it's difficult to have another one soon. No, but I mean, it can be something else. It can be anything. But, you know, some people, even art historians, make an example. Some like Piero della Francesca and others like uh, Mantegna, right? Mantegna. And they discuss about it. One thinks Mantegna is not so good and the other one says Piero is not so good. So one would like to have one and the other. Exactly. I'm talking about Longhi and Berenson. So exactly. Right? They used to fight with each other, between each other. Now, uh, for my collection, I always hope to find uh, more things. I'm happy for what I put together. And it's always challenging. And uh, you always hope to wake up a morning and to find uh, another thing to add. As I said, this is the beautiful part of your master. And having this eye for old masters... What is your eye on contemporary art? You think that some of these contemporary artists will last, some will sleep and then will be rediscovered, some will die, I mean, will not be important? I think that uh, you're perfectly right, some will die. I think that the perfect judge is the time, but there are some artists like Jeff Koons that we mentioned before, Damien Hirst, uh, Gerhard Richter, they will survive, they're the top artists, understand? they will stay there because they have invented something. The artists that invented something, they will stay there. Then afterwards, the market will go up and down. Remember that in the 80s, there was a big uh, crash on uh, Andy Warhol's market. Andy Warhol is a genius. He was still on the market. He's an icon, understand? Actually, I would love to own one day a painting by, by Andy Warhol. He invented the system of contemporary art. He was the portrait man of the 20th century like Pompeo Batoni was in the 18th century. Yeah, in terms of painting, but, uh, one of the iconic people is Duchamp, right? Who invented art that is not art. Exactly. Yeah, Duchamp is art is not art. You can call it also provocazione. Provocation is the same of another Italian artist that his name is Maurizio Catalan. This is one of the most famous uh, and recognizable artists internationally of Italy. And also the prices of his works of art are very, very high. Is art, is provocation? Yeah, but Manzoni is also provocation. And do you follow the same line? You're a specialist in contemporary or modern Italian artists? Or... No, I must say that I am very influenced by the old masters because I'm not so great in contemporary art. I always look contemporary art with the eye of an old master paintings man. So, you know, I collect Jenny Savile, I have paintings of Gerard Richter, mine's the Gerard Richter of 68, when Gerard Richter paints views. Uh, I got Kippenberger as a self-portrait of himself. I'm obsessed by self-portraits by the artist. I love this. I like a lot of American artist George Kondo because I like the idea that he reinterprets uh, the figure of Picasso in these days. In the 50s, late 50s, 60s, especially in America, and I guess later on in the Far East, they are not old masters, they are not contemporary or modern painting, but they are impressionists. Yes. When you talk about portraits, yeah, you probably would like to have a self-portrait of Van Gogh. Or... Why not? Where do you locate the impressionists? 
and are they going to remain so important? The impression in the market is a niche that is not a niche, actually it's a strong niche of the market that has always been very, very powerful. The prices have been, see last week in New York, Christie's and, and Sotheby's, they sold for top prices this impressionist paintings by Van Gogh, by others, by Monet, because uh, they are recognizable, they are beautiful, they are easy to understand. That is something that you need to put in place. Also, when you put a nice painting, everybody can understand. That it means that the market of this painting is worldwide, from China, Japan, America, Russia. It's Russian. easier to live with the portrait by Manet or by Renoir, uh, Renoir than to live with a Lucian Freud. Or bacon. You know, I think the best would be to live with the three of them, but uh, that would be the perfect goal. But if somebody starts, also the nouveau rich people, you know, from Russia, from China, they start uh, and they fell in love with Impressionists. This is why the market is very strong, very strong. And these paintings, uh, they are a must in our market. I never dealt in Impressionists, but uh, it's a very important niche of the market. And then there is this extraordinary painter who starts like a pupil of Cezanne somewhere, like who is Picasso, right? Who is kind of a very late impressionist at the beginning. And exactly. And then becomes completely different. Now, Picasso is the genius also because uh, in uh, 70, 80 years of production, he's not one artist, he's 1,000 artists. He changed it so many times because he wanted to improve, he wanted to change, he wanted to challenge. He was a curious guy. He was the opposite of some other artists that never change. Yeah. Morandi, for example, stayed yeah, with but for instance, Robert Hughes, the famous art critic, considered Morandi as important as Goya. I understand what you are saying. And, uh, for example, for Picasso, being myself or a master man, the period that I love and the painting I would love to have one day, if I can afford it, would be a blue period or a pink period. I love this period where it's influenced by the circus. You remember this painting that was sold for the Whitney, uh, in benefit of the Whitney collection, Il Giovane con la Pipa, in 2004. There was one of the important record prices, $104 million. This belongs to the Indernizzi collection. Now, yes, they bought it. Oh, and this picture is unbelievable. This is what I would like to have. And so Picasso is what? Is an old master, somehow, being very modern? I can tell you, Picasso is everything. Picasso is the past. Picasso goes with Leonardo. I'm sure if the two have met in another world, they would have have a great connection. Picasso, in art, is the past, the present, and the future. And there are no artists like this. They haven't been. No, I don't think so. Picasso is... I think every two or three hundred years, somebody, a person like Picasso won't. So he is certainly going to remain. Oh, yeah. It's a must. Then like Tiziano, they will say, they prefer the old Picasso, the young one, or the middle one. Exactly. You know? It's or, the same. And also the Tiziano, very, very strangely, for the 16th and beginning of the 17th century, he lived until 94, 95 years. So you can imagine. And what these artists have in common, when you see the late works of Titian, of Caravaggio, of Caravaggio Rem- died young. Died young, but the late works, I don't know, maybe he knew he was going to die. The late works are not painted anymore with the color, they paint with the heart. It's amazing. In the late Titian, the late Rembrandt. Let go, yeah. Let go. You can see in those kind of pictures, in that kind of art, the beginning of Impressionist. Because the people, the painters, don't paint anymore academically. They want to put inside the painting uh, the Il Patos. They say that the one who made the bridge you know, between Goya, let's say, and the Impressionist uh, could have been Manet, you know? Who's yes. not really an Impressionist, but he is. Yes, it's the middle point, we will call it. So Manet will be a very interesting painter. Also, Manet is something that, if I find a beautiful portrait... Yeah, but he can was able, like, do, uh, or, like, other, uh, to make an asparagus as a painting, like Zurbaran made lemon. No? I mean, exactly. Yes, and it's, it's quite difficult to make one object uh, and make that object to be so iconic. Speaking about Zurbaran, you know, the best still life of Zurbaran is the one in the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, in California. That, I think, is the greatest still life 
in America. They also have an amazing dog by Guercino. Yes, early Guercino. We haven't seen uh, nowhere else, right? This dog, so the, this huge dog. It's unbelievable. So these amazing collectors were able to create a collection and then a museum. Maybe Lode is another one like that with the Viennese uh, secession, which is another branch again. Yeah. Are these kind of people still existing? At that level, no. I think one not why? why. I can tell you why. Because I think that Norton Simon had the possibility in those years also to find the stock. He found the picture. He was incredibly clever and lucky to put together this amazing collection because he's got some of the best works in private hands, now public hands in the world. Mr. Getty, the same. They lived in a moment where there was a lot of uh, available paintings on the market and they were able to put them together. It's interesting that America, because of people like Berenson or dealers like Duveen and so on and so forth, were able to import incredible collections from the Free Collection to the National Gallery to the Fourth World, the Kimber Museum and others. You would have liked to be in that period when oh. suddenly the Americans discover and bring to them, I mean, these kind of people like Freak Mellon, these huge families. No, no, Jehovah. I would have loved to be in part of that game because, you know, there was not many restrictions in Italy for the export license in those days. And so many paintings, unfortunately for Italy, but fortunately for the world, because they became part of public collections, so everybody can enjoy them today, understand? In America, they have this idea that they give back. They give back, understand? So they're part of public institutions, so they are promoting also the Italian culture in the world, and I think this was quite important for our tourists. People saw important paintings in public museums, and they love the idea to come to Italy and see them in place, because Italy, you know, it's an irreplaceable state, uh, and the cities of Italy, as you said, they are works of art, all of them, all of them. What is very politically incorrect and unpleasant to say is this, uh, mostly during the fascist regime, they were able to build new architecture of some importance, in Italy, no, as a statement everywhere in Italy, yes. or to create a, a group of art. It's a strange thing, no, because nowadays there is not many new statements. After Gio Ponti, after Terragni, after other architects, uh, all the time, the fascists, and, and therefore even up to Molino, you know, furniture and design. But then... We don't have many things in Italy now, as much as there are in America. Look at Paris, you know, there are these two big mesen, you know, Arnaud and Pinot, you know, these guys, they put together a collection, they open museums, and they open... This is very good because... Uh... But that's very good, but it doesn't happen much in Italy. You are right to say, especially because you deal in ancient, the ancient world, the old world, therefore it's very good to preserve it for knowledge and so on and so forth. But what about the new world, the contemporary world? You need... Everybody goes to Venice, right? Yes. And try to buy palazzos. And... Yeah, but it's not the right What's place to new? show contemporary art. You know, the only person that really invested in uh, this kind of structure is Fondazione Prada. They have built uh, in a little outside of Milan a fantastic place to show art. In these days, there is this magnificent exhibition of Domenico Gnoli, an Italian artist that I adore. And I think that there are a lesson for this. Then there are other contaminations in Italy of uh, collectors that wanted to make their collection public. For example, in Palermo, well, the Valsecchi family, they bought uh, a big palazzo forgot the name of the palazzo, and uh, they restored it. I went to see it uh, in a very, very art historic way. And palazzo is open to the public with their foundation. So there is a way to do it, but Italy, for the moment, is not at the same level of America. America, but, you know, this big... Yeah, big but America. also American art seems to be stronger than European art at the moment. I can tell you why. Because American art is supported by American clients, and the number of American clients, they're much bigger than all the European clients. And what the American has that the European... The American person, when he likes something, he buys it. He doesn't think of the price. For the American people, money is something to spend. 
That's why the economy is always active in America. The European, the Italians, they always think, think, think. We were saying Italy. The, the Americans, when they like a picture, they don't negotiate a lot. Which is the best price? Yes, the no. Chinese. The Chinese, they negotiate a lot. <laughs> the Chinese, they like to negotiate. But is the world Asian world the world of tomorrow? For art, I mean, yes. some people open galleries in Hong Kong, in Seoul. Now you're perfectly right. If I was 20, I will go to China because I'm sure that in 20 years that will be the real market. Yeah, but China is a very old country, right? I mean, they're very different from America. Somehow, China is more similar to Europe or to some European countries like France, for instance. Yes, Chinese love the writing, right, the calligraphy, yes. and the French like writing and literature very much. So, in a way, the Chinese probably have more respect for Europe than they have for other countries. Obviously, the other part is America, right, in terms of military power, in terms of trade power. But in terms of culture, they probably yes. look at Europe. So, why shouldn't all European masters become very popular in China? I think because uh, China has a great past as a cultural place that uh, America doesn't have. Yeah, but do you think that old masters will become very interesting yes. for the Chinese collectors as they like tradition? Yes, as they, like? they are. Once they have collected all the Chinese no, no. porcelains and things that I, they, I agree. obviously they buy because their own tradition, but, are they going to look at Rembrandt? Are they going to look yeah, at... Yeah, but this? they do already. There are a number of uh, top Chinese collectors by old masters. And uh, I think in, in the future... The number can be increased. They will say oh, maybe we'll buy it. At the moment, I don't know of a Chinese museum that bought uh, all masters, but I know of Chinese uh, collectors that buy mostly through auction houses. And I think that this market will be a drastical increase. Some people don't like to buy with dealers. They prefer auctions. Of yes. Course, because they don't have time. And yeah. also because they believe that the auction gives a real value of the paint. Some people think that when you buy at auction, you buy, like in the stock market, you buy at the value of the day. I disagree on that, because sometimes uh, you can find uh, two bidders that want something, and they are crazy, the two bidders, and sometimes because they want that item, the item makes a crazy price. It's not That is not the value of the day. That is a craziness. Like some other times could happen that a beautiful painting goes unsold. But it doesn't mean as a bad painting. It means that because that day, maybe that collector didn't bid because he had problems because the stock market went bad. Or maybe there was a museum interested, but, you know, the museum for their painting, they need months, months, months to put everybody together and fund the painting. So auction house is the market of today and of tomorrow. I think that the dealer generation cannot compete against them and uh, Christie's, Sotheby's and then Phillips, they will be the three center of the art world for the future. But the auction value is never the real, real value. You always need to understand the circumstance of the day. Fabrizio Moretti, you are a man who has been sort of an enfant prodige of this work of being an art dealer. So you reach success very, very young. But you are a man of many projects, a man who likes to always think of the future. Now you are established, you have two big galleries, two important galleries, three maybe, because you probably still have a place in Florence. You are in several institutions in scientific roles and therefore very respected by museums, collectors, artists, historians, and so on and so forth. What is your aim? You can't be pleased with yourself. No, I'm never pleased with myself. I wake up always not happy because I think that uh, you need to do more. I never... More or different? More and different because I think life is really a game and you need to understand the opportunities that uh, the life puts you in front. So I like to diversify a little bit. I like to look also at the businesses. Because you are also a businessman. A dealer is what? You're what? A collector, a businessman... No, a dealer is a dealer. You know, if you are a dealer, you can buy and sell everything, understand? And I think that in the DNA, I am a dealer. So you could buy and sell anything? If I like it. 
Only if I like it. For example, I do some investments in real estate, but I will never do an investment on something that I don't like. Also, if it was speculative. Can I uh, ask you something that you don't like and maybe you don't know? And maybe I don't know. I always try to buy the things or invest in things that uh, they are works of art. Art is something that is fundamental in my life. So you mean you buy a building or a house because... Because it's beautiful. Or because you can make something beautiful. Will you describe yourself as a loner? I mean, are you deciding all your things by yourself or you are influenced by the opinion of others? No, no, I am uh, quite uh, myself. I listen to people, especially normally when I ask something, it's because I have already decided. And you're quick in acting? Too much. This is the problem. Why? I'm very impulsive. And sometimes you can do mistakes, and like everybody, I do some mistakes. And when you do a mistake, what happens? C'est la vie. <laughs> Thank you very much for being Pleasure. with me today here in Monte Carlo in your new gallery. And uh, good luck for London and for your new... Pro which will be the, the first exhibition? I'm planning to do an exhibition if I'm clever to put my hands on this painting on a beautiful Artemisa Gentileschi. Another one. Another one. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. Alan Elkan interviews.